Notwithstanding the fact that there are false prophets, there are also those who are preaching the truth as pointed out in the scriptures. With deep earnestness, with honest faith, prompted by the Holy Spirit, they are stirring the minds and hearts by showing them that we are living near the second coming of Christ. Prophecy is fast fulfilling. More, much more should be said about these tremendously important subjects. The day is at hand when the destiny of every soul will be fixed forever. This day of the Lord hastens on apace. The false watchmen are raising the cry, all is well. But the day of God is rapidly approaching. Its footsteps are so muffled that it does not arouse the world from the death-like slumber into which it has fallen. While the watchmen cry peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them, and they shall not escape. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. It overtakes the pleasure lover and the sinful man as a thief in the night. When all is apparently secure and men retire to contented rest, then the prowling, stealthy, midnight thief steals upon his prey. When it is too late to prevent the evil, it is discovered that some door or window was not secured. Be ye also ready, for in such, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. People are now settling to rest, imagining themselves secure under the popular churches. But let all be aware, lest there is a place left open for the enemy to gain an entrance. Great pains should be taken to keep this subject before the people, that the day of the Lord will come suddenly, unexpectedly. The fearful warning of the prophecy is addressed to every soul. Let no one feel that he is secure from the danger of being surprised. Let no one's interpretation of prophecy rob you of the conviction of the knowledge of events which show that this great event is near at hand. It's taken from Fundamentals of Education 335. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Sabbath. Welcome to you all. Um, we don't have a, a PA system this Sabbath, um, at least at the moment. So if you can't hear me, you might want to move a little bit closer. Um, were there any people who were not here last time? Um, I think it was on the 2nd of May, at the beginning of the month, who were here today? Yeah? Oh, so there are some people. Okay. Um, so I just want to, um, not just for your, own, your benefit, but for everybody, just want to have a quick recap of, of what we spoke about last time that we met together so that uh, we can refresh our minds and build upon that, the information that we spoke about. So our thoughts were centred around Revelation 14, as you can remember. We know that Revelation 14 are the three angels' messages. So as Adventists, we all understand that. But what's not so well understood, that's not brought out um, when, when dealing with prophecy, is that in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, let's turn there. Revelation 14. We read, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, 
Give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So that was what we based most of uh, our studies last time that we met. And what we want to understand is that the messages of these three angels is the everlasting gospel. It says it straight in verse 6, that this is the everlasting gospel. And if it's everlasting, it means it's always been here. And so this must be the same gospel that was preached in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15, when God declares that he's going to put enmity between his seed and the seed of the serpent. This is the same gospel that God's people are preaching at the end of the world. But the wording or the test that's brought before God's people and the world in each dispensation changes. So we understand that. So we know if we draw it really in a simple fashion that Revelation 14 verses 6 to 12 has three angels. The first, the second, and the third angel. And we know that the work of these angels is the everlasting gospel. Let's turn to verse 9. And the third angel, so we're just addressing this angel here. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of of the Lamb. So we know, according to verse 9, that the message of the third angel is related to the mark of the beast. Okay, it says here, verse 9, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So we all understand that this is to do with the mark of the beast. And there's a warning not to receive this mark in your forehead or in your hand. So I hope you understand what that terminology means. That when it talks about in your forehead, it's talking about in your mind, that means you're giving an intellectual assent, you agree about the terms and conditions of what this mark is referring to. But when it talks about your hand, you don't have to have an, a, ment- a mental assent. You don't have to agree to what the ideas and the sentiments are behind the receiving of the mark of the beast. You just have to go along with it and give your support. So whether or not you agree with what's going to happen at the end of the world, if you just give your support, or if you are fully fledged into this and you give a, your mental assent to it, you're still going to be under condemnation. And verse 10 tells you what that condemnation is. So this is the mark of the beast. And we know that this is referring to Revelation chapter 13. So as Adventists, we understand this to be relating to the National Sunday Law that's soon to come upon this world. So most Adventists understand reasonably clearly that this third angel is not an experience that you can have. So no one here today is experiencing the third angel's message. You can't have a devotional about it and say, oh, I'm glorifying and having a wonderful experience in the third angel because the third angel is related to an event. It's related to the Sunday law. And that event hasn't 
come upon us yet. It's still a future event. So we understand that clearly as Adventists. But what we have not understood in our generation is that the first and the second angel are also related to historical events. Like the third, they're not experiences that you have. Now, I'm not suggesting that the everlasting gospel is not a salvation experience that each and every one of us has in our personal walk with Christ. We all understand that, that we need to be saved. And the gospel is the mechanism or the way that God is saving his people. But what we have not understood, by and large, as God's people, is that the first and the second angel's messages are also tied to historical events. And these historical events are marked out in prophecy. So the easiest way to see that is if we look at here at the third angel's message, the third way mark, we know this is, this is going to be a historical event. It hasn't come upon us yet, but it's going to be a real event that's going to come upon this world and affect every single human being. We understand that and we believe that. And we also know that this event that's about to occur has been prophesied in the scripture. It's been typified in scripture and it's also been prophesied about. So this is what we mean when we talk about historical events that have been brought to view in prophecy. We understand that the third angel fits that bill, but what we have not understood as God's people is that the first and the second angel's messages also follow the same characteristics. And the studies that we are doing together are bringing to view the first and the second angel in the time period in which we're living here on this history. And as a church, we are required to understand what these two messages are, when they come into history, and what they mean to us, and what we're required to do when those events are fulfilled. If we don't, we just read a moment ago about what happens to those people who aren't aware when this event occurs. Often people, when they, under, when they read this parable and they talk about the thief that comes in the night, they think it refers to Christ. People are under the impression that the thief that we just read about, they think it's Christ. But can that be? No. It cannot be. This is a false interpretation. Because if you read the parable, what does this thief do? He comes to rob, steal, and break up your house. And that's not the work of Christ. This thief is the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord begins right here. In the time of Christ, time of ancient Israel, when they were coming to the end of their communion, their relationship with God, after Christ had died, they began to see events that were occurring in the world and when they saw those events occurring, they interpreted those events through their understanding of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And they saw that these events were foretelling their emancipation, their freedom from Roman bondage. They misunderstood what the day of the Lord 
meant for them. And when they saw wars and rumours of wars, when they saw nature convulsing, they thought these were the signs of their freedom from Roman bondage. But we're told that instead of that, these signs were foretelling their doom and their destruction. Many of God's people, in fact, almost all of God's people, are looking forward to this National Sunday Law that we're all going to pass, we think, and then the second advent's going to happen and we're all going to go to heaven. So we're looking, we're, we look at all the events that are happening on earth as foretelling our freedom from this earth to go to the heavenly Canaan. But the signs that we're seeing being fulfilled here on earth today are the prelude to this day of the Lord or the day of destruction. And this destruction is not only coming upon the world, it's going to be coming upon God's people. And we know that judgment begins first with the house of God. And so we should not be surprised that this destruction is going to come upon God's people before it does the rest of the world. We saw, because this is the everlasting gospel, a three-step testing process that God expects his people to go through, that because it's the everlasting gospel, we should be able to identify this gospel throughout the scriptures. Now, for most of God's people, this truth has been buried. It was once understood, but it's all been covered up and buried so that now we have very little visibility when we read scripture to understand what the everlasting gospel is and how it operates. Perhaps the clearest indication that we can have of what, how the everlasting gospel works and what it is, is when we go and look at the history of the Millerites. When we look at Millerite history from the time period of 1798 to 1844. And in future studies, we're going to be looking at that history in quite some detail, as well as other histories. What God wants us to do is to look back into Scripture, understand the histories that are identified there, and see what those things mean to us. Now, that may seem an unusual idea or something strange, but it really shouldn't be, because we're all familiar with the statement that Christ made when he said, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be at the end of the world. So he already is teaching us that we need to go back into these stories of the Bible, see what those stories um, tell us, and bring that information into our own experience so that we can understand what's going to happen to ourselves, to our children, to our church, and to the world. And for most of God's people, if we do that, the information that we, f that we will see is quite shocking. It's not what you may be expecting. So to give you an idea what, what I want to do as in, in the next weeks and perhaps not months, but in the next few uh, weeks that we meet together, after last week's and today's kind of introduction to the everlasting gospel, just to sort of whet your appetites really, I want to start looking in detail at four histories. We're going to look at the history of Moses, we're going to look at the history of Christ, we're going to look at the history of William Miller, and looking at those histories, we're going to try and make application of our own history. Once we've done that, we're going to start looking at some, in some detail in other portions of the scriptures to make some really detailed 
And I think you'll find profound, we could say predictions, if, that, if we wanted to say that, but some conclusions about what's happening in the world today around us. As an example, each of us here knows that radical Islam is at war with the rest of the world today. But God's people are blind to the significance of what the cause of this warfare is about. But I believe that if you look at Bible history carefully, you can see that history is being repeated and being fulfilled again. And the work that radical Islam is doing has already been prophesied and typified in previous histories. If you see what's going on this year in the United States and laws that are being passed there, what's going on this year with respect to your own church at the upcoming general conference and the votes that are going to be placed there, all of these things have been already typified in scripture and they have a significant impact of what's happening to ourselves just preceding the National Sunday Law. Just preceding the National Sunday Law. We need to understand in a really clear fashion when the first angel's message came into history, when the second angel's uh, message came into history. We're not going to go into all the details of that today, but just to give you an idea of where we are, if we went to Millerite history, we would put here the date of 1798, of 1798. Everybody here is reasonably familiar with 1798. It's when the papal system received its deadly wound by an attack uh, upon it by, of France. The second angel's message came in 1844 in the month of April. And we should all be familiar that the third angels arrived in 1844 in the month of October. So I think most people here are familiar with this date and are familiar with this date. This is the fulfilment of Daniel 8:14. To 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Does everybody know that? Everybody's familiar with that yeah. prophecy? Is everybody familiar with this date? Yeah. And everybody understands what 1798 is? Yeah. So just to give you an idea of where we are today in Earth's history, There was another event in that history, before I lay that out, which was in the year 1844, in the month of August. And this event here, there was an important camp meeting in the Millerite organization, and they had a fresh revelation and further light was given to them about the events that were connected with October 22nd, 1844. So, where we are today is here. And I haven't really drawn this to scale because this event here is a lot closer on this side than it is here. So if I were to draw to scale what's happening in our day and age, the first angel's message has already arrived and passed. The second angel's message has already arrived and passed and we are here just on the verge of the midnight cry. We're just here on the verge of the midnight cry. Now when I use this phraseology, midnight cry, this was the phrase borrowed 
from the Millerites. The Millerites used this phrase of the midnight cry, but they didn't invent this phrase. We all have, should be reasonably familiar with it. It's found in Matthew 25 in connection to the parable of the ten virgins. And I'm sure all of us have read the parable of the ten virgins. In the parable of the ten virgins, there's a cry that's made at midnight after they've all fallen asleep, the five wise and the five foolish. And it's at midnight that these two groups of virgins separate. One group go to Christ and the other group go back into the world. Those that go to Christ enter into the, enter into the marriage and they get here and the door is shut. So you can see here that there is a separation between the wise and the foolish in the parable of the ten virgins. And we're just coming to this point where we're going to enter into this phase of prophetic history. We're right here. Spirit of Prophecy teaches us that there's a great test that's going to come upon God's people. A great test. Now most Adventists believe that this great test that's going to come upon God's people is the National Sunday Law. But that is not correct. The great test that comes upon God's people is not the National Sunday Law. Ellen White says it's the image of the beast. This is the great test that's going to come upon God's people. The test of understanding and recognising that the image of the beast is being erected and set up and not only that but what it actually means because we can read our newspapers and understand what's going on in the world we can see it but we if we don't understand the implications of it then we end up fading this test and this test here this image of the beast test occurs right here i'll put ig ib sorry for image of the beast the image of the beast test, we can demonstrate, occurs right here. And we're just about to reach the point where this image of the beast, it's, it's, it's been in preparation of being set up for quite a while, but now there's going to be visibility of it. And when you see this visibility, if you don't understand and recognise that this image of the beast has been set up, what it means and how you're supposed to respond to it, you will fail the great test for Adventism. And if you fail this great test, you will of a certainty fail this test. Because you know in the parable of the ten virgins, when you get to this point here and Christ comes, the foolish virgins depart from him and they left outside with the door shut upon them and they cannot get in to the marriage. So that's a kind of a brief synopsis of what we looked at last week. Not last week, sorry, uh, about three weeks ago now. Um, it's to try to show God's people that we now have entered into a time period where the everlasting gospel is being repeated. It was fulfilled to the very letter in the history of the Millerites from 1798 to 1844. And in 1844, the third angel's message arrived in history, but it didn't reach its complete fulfilment. The third angel's message didn't reach its complete fulfilment. There wasn't a Sunday law in 1844. The second angel's message didn't reach its complete fulfilment and neither did the first, neither did the first. But we all understand that they will reach their complete fulfilment. There's a phraseology that Adventists use which follows on from the first, second and third angel 
and we call it the fourth, the fourth angel. I don't know if everybody has heard that term, I suspect you have, but it's not an inspired term. This fourth angel is referring to the angel of Revelation 18. And we're told that when this fourth angel joins with this third angel, the message will be empowered and the work will be finished and Christ will return. We've already entered into that history and most of God's people are oblivious to the fact. And for that reason, the vast majority of God's people are going to perish. God wants us to understand biblical history in a really simple and clear fashion so that even a child can understand it. And when we do that, we can fix these concepts and these ideas in our minds really clearly and we can make decisions based upon that information. But if you look around the world today, there are so many voices, so many ideas, so many schemes, it can seem confusing because this is a complicated world. But at the back of all the complications that you can see, God is in order. God is directing everything that is happening here on earth. And he wants his children to understand what is happening and he wants us to understand it in a simple fashion so that we can share that information not only with our brethren but eventually with our neighbours who are in the world so they can understand what's happening in the world and make decisions. I assume we've all read The Great Controversy. I hope you have. If you haven't, please read that book. When you read that book, when you imagine the sentiments and the ideas in that book about what's going to happen at the end of the world, I'm sure that when you think about that, you're probably not any different to me, that it all seems really simple and straightforward. It's going to be a Sunday law. You're going to receive some letter or some request to go down to the county hall and register yourself. It all seems straightforward. Yeah? But the reality of that situation will be a lot more complicated than we can ever imagine. But it's in this simple understanding of those events that we will be able to decide what to do and what not to do. If we think that 18 million Adventists are all going to, under all going to understand and move all together to stand up against this Sunday law, we're sadly mistaken. There are going to be so many voices, so many people saying different things, there's going to be confusion and it's going to be extremely complicated. But God wants us to understand scripture in a really simple way. So this, at, at this uh, day study, what we want to look at is we're going to go from Genesis right through to Revelation and look at this everlasting gospel in a different way than we did last time, but still it has some similarities to it. And we're going to pick up some thoughts and some ideas. As we go and do this, please don't be beguiled by the simplicity and the obviousness of some of these points that are going to be brought up. What God requires us to do is to see as it was in the days of Noah. And that's a really simple story, isn't it? 
An ark is built. Noah instructs the people to get on the ark to be saved. And nobody listens. Even when they see the animals coming on the ark, they still have time to enter in, but they refuse to. So you can explain that story in a really simple fashion and make some application of that story in our own situation. We could do that really simply. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look today from Genesis to Revelation and try and make some simple application. But when we make those applications, what you will find is that the consequences are very significant. The consequences of those decisions are very significant about what we think and what we don't think, what we'll do and what we won't do. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? So, I'll give you the title for today's study first. prophetic chain. So we're going to be looking at the concept of a chain running from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to look at a concept of a chain running from Genesis to Revelation. And we can just draw this really sort of simply of what a chain looks like. So everybody knows that a chain is made up of links. And each link is supposed to be as strong as the other link and they're all identical. Yeah? So we're going to be looking at this chain from Genesis to Revelation. And we're going to be looking at each one of these links. And each one of these links is a model of the everlasting gospel. What we will find is that each one of those links, even though they're dealing with different stories, are all going to have a similar pattern. They're all going to have similar sequences. They're all going to follow a set rule. And by seeing that, if we see it here and here and here, when it comes to the time period in which we're living, we should be able to make some deductions about what's occurring all around us and what you're required to do based upon that information. Okay, so does it make sense what we're going to be doing today? I'm going to ask a question, and it's a rhetorical question. I'm not expecting you to answer it. And by the fact that I'm asking this question, you'll obviously understand that we're going to address this as we go through our study, and, and, and hopefully you'll be able to see this really clearly. Let's, let's do it here. In 1844, what happened in 1844? What begun? Great disappointment. Okay, so in 1844... Just so that you know, when I ask a question, you don't, don't feel you have to answer it. They're normally rhetorical. I'll answer my own questions. Um, so in 1844, the Day of Atonement began. And the Day of Atonement is to do with what? what what's the Day of Atonement to do with? It's to do with the blotting out of sin, isn't it? Yeah? It's the, it's the blotting out of sin. So... We all should be reasonably familiar with how the Jewish economy worked. 364 days a year, any sin that you do is applied to the sanctuary on the curtain between the holy place and the most holy place. 
and on the Day of Atonement, that blood is blotted out, indicating that, or cleansed, that the sins of God's people have now been blotted out and they have a fresh new start. They have no history, no baggage. Yeah? So we could call it the Day of Atonement, or we could call it the cleansing of the sanctuary. And we know that judgment occurs in order from the beginning to the end. So all of us sh should understand that when the Day of Atonement began and the cleansing of the sanctuary began, that the judgment began with the dead. Yeah? So the judgment of the dead began here in 1844. Everybody understands that. Yeah, that's not new information. Now when you get to the final generation that are going to be living on earth, we call them the 144,000 who will not see death, you must realise, it's a logical conclusion, that you're going to transfer from the judgement of the dead to the judgement of the living. Yeah, we're going to move from the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living. So if we just put this here, we're at 1844, we're just there, the third angel's message. The judgment of the dead began, and we're running through history, and at some point, we're going to have the judgment of the living is going to begin. And then we're going to have a close of probation. Probation's going to close when Michael stands up. And the judgment ends. The investigative judgment ends. Everybody familiar with that? So, would it be an important thing to know when this occurred? Yeah? It'd be a pretty important thing to understand when that occurred. If you look around the events that are happening in the world today, do you think the world's just about to end? Everybody is saying that. Except one group of people. God's people. God's people, if you read the information of the material that's coming out from the structured church, you will find very little, if any, sensible, well-researched and documented analysis that the world is just about to end. But if it's true that the world is about to end, do you not think that the issue of the judgment of the living should be an issue that we would need to understand about? The reason why the church does not discuss this issue is because of a misconception that... Let me draw it here. We've said one, two, three, and we said this was the National Sunday Law. This is still future. If you remember, I put the midnight cry here, and I said we're just here in the year 2015. The church, the church's understanding, by and large, is that at the National Sunday Law, things begin to happen. The test begins. They do not recognise that the image of the beast test is the great test that precedes the National Sunday Law. It's the great test for God's people. And the failing this, you will not pass this. They, the whole issue about the judgment of the living 
is all to do and centred around the third angel's message, which is why it's not discussed. Because the common understanding is once that decree goes forth, everyone's going to know about it, so we don't have to worry about it beforehand. Because then you can start sorting your affairs out. But that is an incorrect understanding of prophecy. You can show this over and over again. Hopefully we'll be able to do that. So what I'm suggesting to you is that the judgment of the living begins before this date here. More than that, I'm suggesting that the judgment of the living has already begun. We've already transitioned from the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living. Now that would be a pretty important thing for you to understand, wouldn't it? Because if you're planning a long career, looking to establish a family, deciding what you want to do with your future, if someone were to stand up and say, actually the judgment of the living's begun, it's not worth bothering about doing anything like that. That'd be an important thing to understand. And if you want to get on in the world, you need to live in the city. Because if you go to the country, it's really hard to live. There are very few jobs. There's very little infrastructure. You can't communicate easily. And life is very difficult. Much harder than it is in the city. So if you want to get on in the world, you'd follow the example of Lot. And you'd move down into Sodom and become rich and wealthy. You wouldn't do what Abraham did. But, if you felt that the judgment of the living has begun, and the world's about to come to an end, and we're told, but through inspiration, that we're supposed to get out of the cities, Amen. because if you're in the cities when this happens, you're going to be in serious trouble just like Lot was, you don't want to make some decisions about that if you understood that the judgment of the living has already begun. So this is why these, in, these studies are really important for us to understand. They're vitally important for us to understand. We've already said that we're looking at the prophetic chain. We're going to be seeing how the everlasting gospel is portrayed from Genesis to Revelation. The everlasting gospel is a three-step testing process. One, two, three. But we also know that there's a fourth that joins it. So we can see this really simply, Revelation 14, first, second and third angel's message, then another angel comes to join them or empower them, and the earth is lightened with its glory in Revelation 18. So can everybody see this 3-1 pattern? Yeah? You've got the everlasting gospel, one, two, three, and then a fourth joins it. Okay? We're going to be looking at this pattern, and this is what I'm calling a link. So this information here is one of these links. And we're going to see about, I don't know, maybe seven, eight, nine different links throughout Scripture. We're going to see that they're following this pattern of a combination of three and then one. And we're going to just see some relationships between them. And then we're going to draw some conclusions. So this is a really simple and basic study. But as I said a, a few moments ago, don't be guarded by, by its simplicity. Because the implications of it are quite important for you to understand and to get to grips with. So I've got a bit of reading to do before we start laying anything out on the board. So the first, some of these are, are fairly lengthy, but we need to understand them so we can get a bit of a background.
Patriarchs, sorry, Prophets and Kings 535. Every nation that has come upon the stage of action has been permitted to occupy its place on the earth that the fact might be determined whether it would fulfil the purposes of the Watcher and the Holy One. Prophecy has traced the rise and progress of the world's great empires, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece and Rome. With each of these, as with the nations of less power, history has repeated itself. Each has had its period of test, each has failed, its glory faded, its power departed. So I'm just going to write some sort of He, um, sort of little phrases that as we're reading uh, along here. So we, we saw the phrase here that history has been repeated. While nations have rejected God's principles and in this rejection have wrought their own ruin, yet a divine overruling purpose has manifestly been at work throughout the ages. It was this that the prophet Ezekiel saw in the wonderful representation given him during his exile in the land of the Chaldeans, when before his astonished gaze were portrayed the symbols that revealed an overruling power that has to do with the affairs of earthly rulers. Upon the banks of the river Chebar, Ezekiel beheld a whirlwind seeming to come from the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the colour of amber. A number of wheels intersecting one another were moved by four living beings. High above all these was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings. The wheels were so complicated in arrangement that at first sight they appeared to be in confusion, yet they moved in perfect harmony. So there's apparent confusion, but it's only apparent. Heavenly beings sustained and guided by the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim were impelling those wheels above them. Upon the sapphire throne was the eternal one, and round about the throne was a rainbow, the emblem of divine mercy. As the wheel-like complications were under the guidance of the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim, so the complicated play of human events is under the divine control. So you've all read this uh, prophecy in Ezekiel. The wheels, what do the wheels represent? They represent the complicated affairs on earth and who was controlling those wheels we just said read that God was controlling those wheels through the four cherubim so these wheels within wheels represent the complicated affairs on earth and what God wants us to do is understand how these wheels within wheels operate and as we do that what we're going to find is beneath The, co the apparent complication of what we see, there is order, symmetry, and simplicity. There's apparent confusion, but it isn't confusing. Once you know what the rules are, once you know how to interpret what those rules are, and make some application, you can see that in these Bible stories, the seemingly apparent confusion or the complication or the irrelevant information all has a bearing, a significant bearing and it's all there for a purpose. That's what we want to see and that's what we want to educate ourselves to understanding when we read the scriptures for ourselves. The history of nations speaks to us today. To every nation and to every individual, God has assigned a place in his great plan. Today, men and nations are being tested by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are, to, all are by their own choice deciding their destiny, and God is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. The prophecies which the great I Am has given in his word, uniting link after link 
in the chain of events. So you can see where I'm getting this concept of a chain with links in it. From eternity in the past to eternity in the future, tell us where we are today in the procession of the ages and what may be expected in the time to come. So to summarise what we just read there, she says that past history going right up to future history is represented by links which are linked up one with another to form a chain. And these links are explaining to us or showing us what our present and our future history is. All that prophecy has foretold has come into pass until the present time has been traced on the pages of history and we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. The only problem is that we don't know how to interpret what those figures, what those symbols mean in scripture. Once you get the tools to understand how to interpret what they mean, then you could begin to understand and make sense of those scriptures. Today the signs of the times declare that we are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Everything in our world is in agitation. Before our eyes is fulfilling the Saviour's prophecy of the events to precede his coming. Ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And we think all of those things are the prelude to our freedom, but they're the prelude to our destruction as God's people. The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element and they recognise that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. I hope you all watch the news so you know that there's an enormous global struggle between the West and the Middle East. And statement, statesmen do not, know how to, do not know how to resolve what is going on, primarily because they don't understand the cause of what's going on. Because everybody thinks this is just some warfare between two religious factions that hasn't got any, any basis. But you can demonstrate quite conclusively that this warfare is a fulfilment of prophecy. The Bible and the Bible only gives the correct view of these things. Here are revealed the great final scenes in the history of our world, events that already are casting their shadow before and sound their approach, causing the earth to tremble and men's hearts to fail them for fear. So these signs that we're seeing, these things that are happening all around us, we just read here, only the Bible can give a correct interpretation of what's happening. Only the Bible can do that. Only the Bible can explain to you why the United States of America is the global superpower of this world. If you are wondering what's going to happen with Russia or China and who's going to win this struggle, where Islam fits into all of this, the only place that you'll find those answers to are in the Bible. It says, here are revealed the great final scenes in, earth, in the history of our world, events that already are casting their shadows before. In the time period when this was written, those events were standing here and they were casting a shadow upon the earth. But we've come to a time period now where those shadows have become the real thing. Now we can behold the reality, not the shadow of that reality. And when we can see the reality of those things that were cast in the shadow in Ellen White's day, we can now see the shadow of Christ approaching at his second advent. What we're seeing today are the shadow of Christ's second advent.
I'm not going to address this, but I want to give an example of what we just read a moment ago about having the Bible interpret things for us and having the correct tools and understanding so that we can make a correct application of what the Bible is trying to teach us. Everybody here is familiar with Daniel chapter 2. So in Daniel chapter 2, it speaks of a mountain in Daniel chapter 2. And it says, from this mountain, a stone is within it. And this stone gets cut out of this mountain. And then this stone comes and destroys this image, this statue. And then after doing that, that this stone here becomes a great mountain itself. Now, if you don't have the correct tools to understand all this symbology, the prophecy really doesn't make much sense. Adventists are pretty expert at understanding this statue. The gold, the silver, the brass, the the iron and the clay. We have a fairly good grasp of what this means. But there are many of us who haven't even given any thought or any time to consider what this mountain was or what this stone is or how this stone turns into a mountain. In fact, what a mountain represents. What we simply do is, by and large, we just say all of this in some shape or form is related to the second advent of Christ who's going to come and destroy this image and everything's going to be happy ever after. And that's fine for a children's story but that's not what God is trying to teach us through this detailed symbology. This is the first prophecy, the first mention of all of these great powers in a vision. And everything that you want to know, everything that you need to know about the end of the world is all contained in Daniel chapter 2. Yet God's people don't have a clear understanding of who and what those symbols represent. So for instance, this mountain when was the mountain around? What time period is it speaking about? Who is the mountain? The stone that was cut out of the mountain. When was it cut out? What does the stone represent? When the stone's cut out, it grows into a big mountain here. And in the chapter, it clearly tells you that this is God's kingdom. You'll remember that. How many kingdoms does God have? One. So, if this was God's kingdom, and this stone came out of the mountain here, this also must be God's kingdom. So you have God's kingdom here, God's kingdom here, and now you have a separation. So who, which, which it has now become God's kingdom? Is it the mountain or is it the stone? So if this stone is God's kingdom, whatever happened to the mountain? So, I'm only pointing out that if you don't review and study these things carefully for yourself and and understand what they mean, you just gloss over all this information and you're going to miss what the scriptures are trying to teach you. Because by and large, as I've said, the church teaches that this stone is the second advent of Christ destroying the kingdoms of the earth. (coughs) but there's a lot of detail in that chapter and God wants us to understand what it means when those things occurred and make some application in our lives, some practical application about what this actually means, make some decisions, some choices based upon that. And you can find all of this information in the scriptures really, really, relatively simply, relatively simply. So, That's what I mean about having the correct tools to make a correct application of what you read in Scripture. Five testimonies. 
752. 5 testimonies. Do I need a time check? I wasn't sure what time I started. The vision was given to Ezekiel at a time when his mind was filled with gloomy forebodings. It's still talking about the same vision. He saw the land of his fathers lying, des laying, lying desolate. The city that was once full of people was no longer inhabited. The voice of mirth and the voice of praise were no more heard within her walls. The prophet himself was a stranger in a strange land where boundless ambition and savage cruelty reigned supreme. That which he saw and heard of human tyranny and wrong distressed his soul and he mourned bitterly day and night. But the wonderful symbols presented before him besides the river Chebar revealed an overruling power mightier than that of earthly rulers. Above the proud and cruel monarchs of Assyria and Babylon, the God of mercy and truth was enthroned. The wheel-like complications that appeared to the prophet to be involved in such confusion were under the guidance of an infinite hand. The Spirit of God revealed to him as moving and directing these wheels brought harmony out of the confusion. So the whole world was under his control. Myriads of glorified beings were ready at his word to overrule the power and policy of evil men and bring good to his faithful ones. In like manner, when God was about to open to the beloved John the history of the church in f for future ages, he gave him an assurance of the Saviour's interest and care for his people by revealing to him one like unto the Son of Man, walking among the candlesticks which symbolised the seven churches. While John was shown the last great struggles of the church with earthly powers, he was also permitted to behold the final victory and deliverance of the faithful. He saw the church brought into deadly conflict with the beast and his image, and the worship of that beast enforced on pain of death. Just going to stop there. When it says deadly conflict, do you think that's literal or symbolic? Literal. It's literal. If you go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, it talks about those who are beheaded because of their refusal to accept the mark of the beast. When it talks about a deadly, woo, um, a deadly conflict, it's talking about a real deadly conflict. And when you look around the world today, you just can't imagine that to be so. You know, the peace and safety that we live in. But looking beyond the smoke and din of the battle, he beheld a company upon Mount Zion with the Lamb, having instead of the mark of the beast, the Father's name written in their foreheads, and again he saw them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God and singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. These lessons offer our benefit. Just want to recap. We first started, the first section of this uh, reading was dealing with Ezekiel's vision that we, that we read a moment ago about the wheel-like complications then she says, in like manner, God showed John what was going to happen at the end of the world. So this vision of Ezekiel and all these complications, what are they dealing with? They're dealing with what's happening at the end of the world. I don't know if we all know the time period or the setting of Ezekiel's visions. Ezekiel is captive in Babylon. This is when Nebuchadnezzar has taken Israel captive, destroyed Jerusalem, and they're all taken to Babylon for the 70-year captivity. You've all heard of that. This is the time period when Ezekiel is having his ministry. And so when we're told that in like manner, God has shown John what's going to happen in the future, we know that all of the things that Ezekiel is experiencing and seeing and all those things which look really complicated are all referring to the end of the world. So, just by re understanding that, what do we know about the end of the world? One thing, one thing that we certainly know about the end of the world is this, that God's people, because of their rebellion against him, what's going to happen to them? 
They're going to get destroyed and they're going to get taken into Babylon. They're going to get taken into Babylon because of their refusal to obey his word. Because she compares the history of Ezekiel to the future predictions that John was seeing in the book of Revelation. When I drew this picture over here, someone uh, mentioned uh, from the congregation when I said well, you've got the mountain and you've got the stone and they're separate and you've only got one kingdom, what's the mountain? Someone said it becomes Babylon because they get taken captive by Babylon just like they were in the time period of Ezekiel. These lessons are for our benefit. We need to stay our faith upon God for there is just before us a time that will try men's souls. What does it mean to try men's souls? What does it mean the word try? The word try means to test. Men's souls are going to be tested. Men are going to be tested. And how is God going to test us? He's going to test us in a three-step testing process, which is the everlasting gospel. We mentioned this last week. I didn't introduce it again today. But in John chapter 16, uh, beginning from about verse 7, it talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. The testing of God is of sin, righteousness and of judgment. Christ upon the Mount of Olives rehearsed the fearful judgments that were to precede his second coming. You shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these, if you think things are bad now, all these are the beginning of sorrows. They're about to get extremely, wor extremely worse, much worse than you, can, than you can even imagine. While these things, while these prophecies received a partial fulfillment in the destruction of Jerusalem, they have a more direct application to the last days. So Jesus compared the destruction of Jerusalem to the destruction that's going to happen at the end of the world. And why was Jerusalem destroyed? Who destroyed Jerusalem? Rome. Rome destroyed Jerusalem. And Rome is a type of Babylon. It's a continuation of Babylon. So you can see that in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, God's church, because of her unfaithfulness, why did Rome destroy God's church, Jerusalem? Because of her unfaithfulness. And it says they received a partial fulfillment then. They have a more direct application to the last days. We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Prophecy is fast fulfilling. The Lord is at hand. There is soon to open before us a period of overwhelming interest to all living. Because it's the judgment of the living. She's saying it's just about to happen. And I've already indicated we're right here and most people who are listening to this presentation, most, maybe half the people in this room at least, didn't even realise we've passed the first two testing processes. They've already been and gone while you were asleep. And we're just on the borders of Canaan. The controversies of the past are to be revived. Do you know what the controversies of the past were? Mm -hmm. Go and read Fox's, books of Martyr, uh, Fox's Book of Martyr and about the Dark Ages, about the Inquisition. Old controversies of the past are to be revived. Go look at the doctrinal issues that have existed in this church. Go and read about the Alpha of apostasy because the Omega is right before your eyes. Go and look at the rebellion that, are occur that occurred in 1888. Do you know what the rebellion was about in 1888? How it started. It started because the leading men, it wasn't the laity, it was the leading men of the church, because they kept on getting constantly rebuked by the prophet of the Lord, they began to conspire against her and took a position that they no longer accepted that she, all of her writings were inspired statements. So they, they began a rejection of the inspiration of spirit of prophecy, which led to a rejection of the inspiration of portions of the scripture, and that was all before 1888. And what 1888 marks what? 
1888 marks the outpouring of the latter rain. And there was rejection of the latter rain. It was pouring on hearts all around them, but people saw that as fanaticism and they rebelled and walked and warred against it. The scenes to be enacted in our world are not yet even dreamed of. Satan is at work through human agencies. Those who are making an effort to change the constitution and secure a law enforcing Sunday observance little realise what will be the result. A crisis is just upon us. She's now talking about the constitution. She just said here that the constitution and the law securing enforcement of Sunday observance is going to happen. Which is, if I just put here the National Sunday Law. So she's inferring that there's going to be a change of the constitution right here. That's, that's what she just said. Let's, let's refer ourselves back to a little snippet of a story in the book of Genesis. So, in the book of Genesis, you've got six days of creation. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven. The seventh was the Sabbath. That's when the Sabbath was instituted. What was instituted on the sixth day? Marriage. Marriage. So you can see the relationship between marriage and the Sabbath. Between marriage and the Sabbath. And we know at the end of the world, there's going to be a change in the constitution that's dealing with the Sabbath issue. So there's going to be a Sabbath Sunday warfare or fight. This is when the National Sunday Law yeah. is going to happen. And this is the day of the Lord. Isn't the Sabbath the day of the Lord? Yeah? So this is the day of the Lord. This is the warfare that's going to happen at the end of the world, typified in the story of Genesis. And what's the day before the day of the Lord? It's the day of the Lord's preparation. If you read the book of Joel, it says in the day of the Lord's preparation, you're supposed to prepare for the day of the Lord. You're supposed to have a solemn assembly with weeping and mourning and fasting in the day of the Lord's preparation. And we just read there's going to be a law enacted here which is doing away with the Constitution we'll find that in the day of the Lord's preparation, there's going to be laws enacted that are dealing with the issue of marriage. If you're keeping up with the newspapers, you can already see that happening. There are laws that are dealing with the issue of marriage, which are going to be preceded, preceding the change of the constitution regarding the Sabbath. One in the day of the Lord's preparation in which we're living now and one in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord's preparation began at 9-11. The day of the Lord's preparation began at 9-11. It will end at the National Sunday Law when the day of the Lord will begin. A crisis is just upon us. But God's servants are not to trust themselves in this great emergency. In the visions given to Isaiah, to Ezekiel and to John, we see how closely heaven is connected with the events taking place upon the earth and how great is the care of God for those who are loyal to him. The world is not without a ruler. The program of coming events is in the hands of the Lord. The majesty of heaven has, desti has the destiny of nations as well as the concerns of his church in his own charge. We permit ourselves to feel altogether too much care, trouble and perplexity in the Lord's work. Finite men are not left to carry the burden of responsibility. We need to trust in God, believe in him and go forward. The tireless vigilance of the heavenly messengers and their unceasing employment in their ministry 
in connection with the beings of earth show us how God's hand is guiding the wheel within the wheel. The divine instructor is saying to every actor in his work, as he said to Cyrus of old, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. In Ezekiel's vision, God had his hand beneath the wings of the cherubim. This is to teach his servants, to teach you and I, that it is divine power that gives them success. He will work with them if they will put away iniquity and become pure in heart and life. The bright light going among the living creatures with the swiftness of lightning represents the speed with which this work will finally go forward to completion. He who slumbers not, who is continually at work for the accomplishment of his designs, can carry forward his great work harmoniously. That which appears to finite minds entangled and complicated, read the newspapers, if you think it all looks really complicated, the Lord's hand can keep in perfect order. He can devise ways and means to thwart the purposes of wicked men and he will bring to confusion the counsels of them that plot mischief against his people. But only if you put iniquity out of your lives and you become pure in heart and life. Let's pray. <clears throat>